Hello everyone, it's me, John Lorden, back with another edition of Brain Scratch. I hope you're all having a great holiday season. And for this one, we're going back to a case that's been highly suggested. It's actually one of the first um, suggestions that I got from all of you. Thank you so much for contributing in the comments section, not only with your thoughts and theories and additional information on these cases, but I really appreciate the suggestions. My list is getting up close to about 200 suggestions now. Um, so just so you know how it works, I basically keep tabs on each of the suggestions. And as soon as I hear enough people ask for the same suggestion, that's usually a little nudge to me that, hey, this case should probably get moved up in priority. And that's exactly what happened on this case about Maura Murray. And um, thank you for everyone that suggested that. To start with, I took a look at this uh, 2020 report on investigation discovery. And it's, it's a split episode um, between two different cases. Mora is only featured for about half of it. And I think that's very unfortunate. After I saw this episode, I went digging for more facts. And this case is literally a tangled mess of information. Um, I don't know if all of it's good or solid. Uh, plenty of different theories about what potentially happened to this girl. Um, quite honestly, I don't even think we're going to be able to cover everything in this brain scratch format. Um, I, I just, I don't think that there's enough time. Uh, luckily, there are some other internet armchair detectives that have been doing some really good work on this case. So I'm, all, I'm going to introduce you to some of their work. Of course, I will have links for all of their stuff in the description box below. So if you want to tear into this case even more, um, there's plenty to look at and I will have tons of information for you to check out in the description box below. So let's get started here. Um, first, I wanted to call out this YouTube channel, which is actually the Missing Maura Murray YouTube channel. And these are two men that are working on a documentary about her. Uh, their names are Lance Rian Stierna and Tim Pilleri. And I've checked out so far about five of their podcasts. Um, I kind of wish they did video. I would just like to see these guys while they're talking. But pretty much if you check out these videos, you're going to see that banner for Missing Maura Murray. And it is essentially a podcast format. That being said, it is really good. Um, both of these guys are coming in with their own viewpoints and they debate certain items, which uh, is something I really dig. Maybe something I would like to do on Brain Scratch at some point in the future. Um, I know that kind of happens in the comment sections, but it's, it's neat in this format to hear it live kind of going back and forth. Um, they've dug into the case uh, at, in depth and they have a ton of information. And basically, if you watch the 2020 special that'll give you a very brief overview of the story and kind of the parents point of view of Mora um, which is kind of limited I mean think about what your parents knew about you and what you were doing when you were in college and I don't know if that is exactly a total representation of the person the the young person um, and as you're going to find in this case, there are many different sides to Mora, a lot more than what's presented in that 2020 special. That being said, these guys dive into almost every aspect, every weird story, every loose end, and they are also interviewing other people. Um, this podcast series is coming up, I think, on 20 episodes. They usually range about 30 minutes long, but I see some of them are going longer, getting up to an hour. I think they have a few that might even go over an hour. So I was trying to review as much of it as I could before I shot this, but I just came to the conclusion that it, there was just too much to cover, way too much information. So I'm gonna do my best to give you guys an overview, kind of like the 2020 version, but notice the differences in these other stories we're hearing. And hopefully at the end, we can start theorizing about potentially what might have happened to Mora. Um, but very good work that these guys are doing. I really appreciate their stuff. So as usual, we're gonna start on the Wikipedia article, which is, uh, I always view it as the most popular known story. Um, of course, Wikipedia is edited by people, but it is moderated. 
um, and they do cite their sources so you can backtrack this information. I have noticed sometimes when I try to go to those sources that they aren't there anymore, which is a little unfortunate, um, but they've done a very extensive article here. Here's a picture of Mora. Mora Murray disappeared the evening of February 9th, 2004 after crashing her car on Route 112 in Haverville, New Hampshire. A nursing student at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, Murray left campus earlier that afternoon after packing her car and emailing her professors and work supervisor that she was taking a week off due to a family emergency. No family emergency existed. So from what I'm hearing from the additional information, it was an act, she actually said that there was a death in the family. So this was pretty easy to verify that there was not an actual death in the family. And I believe that statement has led some people to believe that she might have intended on committing suicide. Due to her preparations and no evidence of foul play, police investigators have suggested that she may have wanted to disappear and have treated her case as a missing persons investigation, but some of her family and friends believe she was abducted. Um, they do a very good timeline here, so I just want to jump into the timeline and uh, go through it, and I'm going to note it. I'm going to note some additional information as we're going through the Wikipedia timeline. In November 2003, three months before her disappearance, Mora was arrested for using a stolen credit card. The charge was continued in December to be dismissed after three months' good behavior. Um, from what I understand, she says that she found a credit card receipt, um, possibly in the trash at her dorms, and she decided to use that credit card number and she ordered a lot of food, like a lot of pizzas and subs. And uh, some people have speculated that she was bulimic. There are a few of her friends that say, uh, actually a roommate in particular, that says um, her issues with bulimia were well known. Um, it's strange, because this is a woman that was an athlete. She was a runner, um, but you know, bulimia is a, a terrible disorder and affects people in different ways. Um, I don't know if she ordered all that food for herself. I don't think anyone really knows. Um, it could have been, you know, maybe she was going to a party or something. I really have no idea. On Thursday, February 5th, 2004, around 10.30 p.m., Morris spoke on the phone with her older sister Kathleen while on break from her campus job. They discussed Kathleen's relationship problems with her fiancé. Hours later, still on her shift, Mora broke down into tears. Her supervisor escorted her back to the dorm room of around 1.20. Mora apparently did not share with anyone the reason for her breakdown. Um, her supervisor noted that she was just out of it, like she was just staring blankly. Um, her supervisor tried to help her, tried to offer, you know, you can call me anytime, left her phone number with her, um, and... Mora just didn't seem to want to accept any additional help there. Um, from what I've heard so far, there's nothing disputing the story about this conversation, about her sister um, speaking to her about possible problems with her fiancé. Um, my personal opinion on this, which is all it is right now, is perhaps that talk about her sister having relationship trouble might have echoed with something that Mora was going through in terms of her own relationship, which we're gonna get into here in a bit. On Saturday, February 7th, Mora's father, Fred Murray, arrived in Amherst. That afternoon, they shopped for a used car and later went to dinner with a friend of Mora's. Mora dropped her father off at his motel room and borrowing his Toyota Corolla, returned to the campus to attend a dorm party with her friend. At 2.30 a.m., she left the party and drove the Corolla with the intention of returning it to her father. At 3.30 a.m., en route to his motel, she struck a guardrail on Route 9 in Hadley. Police questioned her but didn't file charges or administer a sobriety test. She was driven back to her father's motel and stayed in his room the rest of the night. At 4.49, she called her boyfriend in Oklahoma to discuss the accident. So there are some other details um, that the um, missing Mora Murray guys have pulled out around this. Uh, apparently, her father actually went with her and bought alcohol for this party that she was going to, and then still allowed her to borrow his brand new car, um, probably having some foresight that she was going to be drinking. And it does appear that when police got on the scene, 
Um, they obviously did not process her for a DUI. However, there is some information to suggest that she might have been intoxicated when this accident occurred. One of the main things that hit me about the 2020 um, footage, the first documentary I saw, was they were talking to her family members and they were saying, look, this is a girl that was a straight A student, literally straight A's from, um, from the start of school until high school. Then she went to West Point Academy and something happened there where um, she at either decided to leave or she might have been asked to leave or she thought she was going to get in trouble. Now, one of the stories I've heard is that she was caught stealing makeup um, and that that could have been a big enough problem for her that the academy would have uh, seen that as a breach of their ethics code and, and released her from the school. She decided to leave the school apparently of her own accord, I think before any charges could come out around that. Um, so the, the mora that they depict in the 2020 special, this all-American girl, never done wrong, um, does not really seem to reflect what has happened uh, with the research the other guys, uh, the other armchair investigators have done around this case. Um, besides stealing the makeup, we know she stole the credit card number and used that. She has now um, supposedly been drunk driving, crashed her father's new car, and then we have another event we're going to get to. Um, she did have a long-term boyfriend. There was some talk about them potentially getting married at some point. And uh, it seems like it was a distance relationship with him being in Oklahoma. Um, Sunday morning, Fred Murray determined the auto damage. Uh, that's her father, by the way. Determined the auto damage was covered by his insurance. He rented a car, dropped Mora off at the university, and departed for Connecticut. At 11.30 p.m. that evening, Fred phoned Mora, reminding her to obtain the forms pertaining to the accident on Monday from the Registry of Motor Vehicles. They agreed to talk again Monday night to discuss the forms and together fill out the insurance claim. All right, so now we're getting to where she's leaving. Around midnight Monday, February 9th, shortly after speaking with her father, her father, Mora used her personal computer to search MapQuest for directions to the Berkshires and Burlington, Vermont. Uh, supposedly, she had vacationed out there with family members before. She also placed a couple phone calls to places asking about uh, renting rooms. Um, so apparently, she was taking some type of, of getaway. At 1 p.m., Mora emailed her boyfriend, I got your messages, but honestly, I didn't feel like talking to much of anyone. I promised to call today, though. Around 1 p.m., she also made a phone call to inquire about renting a condominium. Uh, I mentioned that already. Um, they did not rent the condo to Mora. And as far as I know, despite her making these phone calls and trying to make arrangements, she didn't actually book anything at any particular place. At 1.24, Mora emailed a work supervisor at the nursing school f faculty um, that she would be out of town for a week due to a death in her family, and she would contact them when she returned. There was no family emergency at the time. At 2.05, she called a number which provides pre-recorded info about booking hotels in Stowe, Vermont. She listened to it for about five minutes. And at 2.18, she telephoned her boyfriend and left a voice message promising him they would talk later. That call was only uh, ended after a minute. In her car, she packed clothing, toiletries, and college textbooks. When her room was searched later, campus police discovered most of her belongings packed in boxes and the art removed from the walls. It is disputed whether she packed them that day or if they were merely still packed from her recent return from winter break. That's a very interesting point and would definitely give some people possible insight into what is going on in her mind. If she did pack everything uh, that day, supposedly for this trip of hers, uh, was she anticipating having some trouble at her current school or was she possibly anticipating quitting her current school and leaving and uh, trying to possibly start a new life somewhere else or, or something to that effect? And then of course there's also the other aspect, was she potentially thinking of ending her life? Uh, apparently, she had borrowed a lab coat from a fellow student, and she returned that lab coat to the student before taking this trip, um, which some people also see as a sign of her kind of tying up loose ends. Um, also worth noting, some people do 
seem to suggest that people that are going to commit suicide occasionally do pack their own things so that the people that have to deal with their stuff after they're gone don't have a lot of work to do and uh, they apparently don't want to be a nuisance to, to the people they're leaving behind. At 3.40, Mora withdrew $280 from an ATM. Um, I've heard varying amounts on that, but essentially she took out all the money that she could without closing the account. She took out, she rounded to the nearest 20 and pulled all that out. Um, she did have paychecks apparently still coming in. Um, at a nearby liquor store, she purchased about $40 worth of alcoholic beverages, including Bailey's Irish Cream, Kahlua, vodka, and a box of Franzia wine. Footage also shows she was alone when she made that purchase. At some point in the day, she obtained registry of motor vehicle accident report forms as they were found later in her car. Mora then left Amherst, presumably via Interstate 91 North. She called to check her voicemail at 4.37 p.m., the last recorded use of her cell phone. Uh, that was that she was checking voicemail back at the dorms. She was using her cell to call into the voicemail system at the dorms. As far as I know, we don't know if there were messages or what message she might have been trying to get um, on her dorm room voicemail. To date, there is no indication she informed anyone of her destination or evidence she had chosen one. Sometime after 7 p.m., a Woodsville, New Hampshire resident heard a loud thump outside of her house. Through her window, she could see a car up against the snowbank along Route 112, also known as Wild Amonosuk Road. The car pointed west on the eastbound side of the road. She telephoned the Grafton County Sheriff's Department at 7.27 p.m. to report the accident. At about the same time, another neighbor saw the car as well as someone walking around the vehicle. She witnessed a third neighbor pull up alongside the vehicle. That neighbor, a school bus driver returning home, noticed the young woman was not bleeding but cold and shivering. He offered to telephone for help. She asked him not to call the police. One police report says pleaded and assured him she's already called AAA. AAA has no record of any such call. Knowing there was no cell phone reception in the area, the bus driver continued home and phoned the police. Um, also worth noting here, one of these neighbors says that they saw what appeared to be a man sitting in the passenger seat smoking a cigarette. And then later they have recanted that information saying they're, they're not really sure if it was a man. Um, some people think that the cell phone that she was using might have had a red light that was blinking on it. The type of Samsung phone that she had apparently uh, had that back in that day. But even according to this, there isn't really cell phone service up there. Um, the two investigators from Missing Maura Murray have been to this part of the country and they say that even current cell phones don't get service there. So uh, I'm not sure why she would be using a cell phone that isn't working. And it's strange because there is no other instance where someone is describing that there was a second person at the scene. Everyone seems to suggest that there was only Mora at the scene. At 7.46, a Haver Hill police officer arrived at the scene. So you can see the woman noticed it at 7.27. Well, she called at 7.27. We know that it was the accident happened sometime after 7.00. But by 7.46, we have an officer on the scene. So assuming, let's assume that this did happen at 7. That is less, much less than an hour. That's only 46 minutes after the fact. Um, they arrive very quickly within 20 minutes of the first phone call uh, that they receive. Quickly relative um, for an area that is this rural. Um, and Mora is nowhere to be found. No one was inside or around the car. The car's windshield was cracked on the driver's side and both airbags had deployed. The car was locked. Inside and outside the car, he discovered red stains that looked to be red wine. The officer found a damaged box of Franzia wine on the rear seat. In addition, he found a AAA card issued to Maura Murray, blank crash report forms, gloves, compact discs, makeup, two sets of MapQuest driving directions, one to Burlington, Vermont, another to Stowe, Vermont, Mora's favorite stuffed animal, which was actually given to her by her uh, long-term boyfriend, and not without peril, a book about mountain climbing in the White Mountains. Uh, she had been hiking all her life and really loved being out in the wilderness, so that was a hobby of hers. Missing were Mora's debit card, credit cards, and cell phone, none of which have been located or used since. So 
that's where she disappears and at this point you have to ask yourself a few questions. <laughs>